All right, everyone, welcome back. As I told Senior Design this morning, I'm happy to see that uh, you all didn't turn into blocks of ice over the winter break. Um, of course, we say that here, and then there's the folks in like Buffalo, New York, that are like, <laughs> really? <laughs> all right. So again, uh, welcome back. Um, uh, I'm going to get sort of right into it today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about just the course overview, which uh, you all had me last semester for structural analysis, so I think you're going to find that there's not a massive difference between the way I run this class and the way I ran uh, structural analysis, so a lot of that will go uh, pretty quickly. But a couple things I wanted to talk about right off the bat. Um, first off, did everybody get uh, this packet of handouts that I passed out earlier? Did everybody get that? All right, here's that. And then here, I'm just going to set this over here. I'll let you come grab this. All right. So first off, I am recording this class just like I've, I've done my others. I, I've already got the playlist created, and it's uh, linked on Blackboard, so you all can uh, find that there. I'm going to pull up Blackboard here in a second because there's a couple things I want to show you. Um, I haven't yet determined my office hours. Um, I only teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday this semester, so I'm not sure if I'm going to have office hours Tuesday, Thursdays. But even if I don't, I mean, you all know where to find me. I'm, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. <coughs> um, I did thought, I think I, it would be worth mentioning, um, I, in case you all uh, weren't aware, uh, our administrative assistant in the engineering division uh, resigned. Uh, the reason I mention it is because if there's any paperwork or anything that you need to get done um, or you know some forms you need signed or whatnot, I just wanted to give you a heads up on that because if there's some, I'll, I'll make up a scenario. If you've got a form tenant turned in, you need it turned in by you know February 15th, and you go, oh, I'll just go there February 14th, and no one's there. I wanted to give you a heads up. So just just be aware of that. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the course operation, course overview, and I'm actually going to sort of get right into it today because I want to talk a little bit about. Oh, goodness, I'm messing stuff up already. Tried to grab the the uh, your first day, yeah. I'm so nervous. Um, I tried to grab the remote and I started yanking the mouse. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, just the course operation. And I actually want to sort of get right into it and talk about design philosophies and how we actually go about the stuff that we go about. But first thing, um, let me start off but before I actually get into the notes. I actually want to pull up Blackboard. So I'm on the Blackboard page uh, for concrete design and I'm in student preview mode. So this should be how you view it. Um, uh, I mentioned last semester, you know, that, that when you all do those uh, course eval surveys and, and, and FCAR surveys at the end of the semester that, it, you know, if there are some comments and whatnot in there that are worthwhile, I, I actually take them to heart. One of the comments I got last semester, which was a very reasonable comment, was that I sort of waited until the last minute to post lecture notes, which I was, you know, last semester was me trying to keep my head above water. so that was going to happen, but that isn't the case with this semester. If you go to course content and you go to lecture notes and design aids, bam, that's everything for the entire semester. The only thing that you, in my opinion, that you actually need like a, a physical copy of are the design aids and supplements, and there's four of them. That's what these are, okay? So uh, the first one is just uh, some basic shear and moment formulas, which we'll talk about later on. Um, the two single page ones are beam design aids and slab design aids, and then there's one on beam columns. Uh, now some of these, I mean, you've got to be aware, like for, for instance, the beam column one, we're not going to even use that until like April, but it's going to be a while. But this is what you need for the semester, period, okay? Every single lecture note from here until the end of April is posted, okay? I even went ahead and posted exam review slides, even though they're not really relevant right now. But uh, everything's there, so you can print off or keep those you know, to, to, to your heart's content. Um, <coughs> let me see. Grades, I've already got everything for the most part already set up. Uh, I'm going to be uh, assigning homework throughout the semester, so some of the weights will change. But I've, I've already got everything set up, and it's ready to go, yes. What are the chances for those changing? Honestly, probably not. Um, I, the code hasn't changed, so uh, probably not. Um, I might have a typo or something I'll see every now and then, but I don't know that I'll actually change the notes. Now, uh, um, I will say this. Um, there is a ch if there's any set of notes that I might change, it might be the exam review slides. But I, 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 don't, I really don't think so. The exams pretty much are what they are. So I, I, don't think, 
I don't think they're really going to change. Other than typos, probably not. Um, everybody good so far? Okay, let me pull up the syllabus because there's a couple things I want to point out. Um, actually, I already have that loaded up. Uh, I, I've spent a little time, I've, I've taught this class, this is one of the classes I've taught quite a bit. I've actually taught this class uh, more often than I've taught anything else at Marshall. So I, I've, I've got my schedule down pretty rigorously and I wanted to show you this. If you go to the syllabus, this is literally the day-by-day -day schedule for the semester. Okay? This is what we're covering every day, when your homeworks are going to be assigned, when they're due, etc. Now, this might get tweaked a little bit, but, but honestly, probably not that much. I've even got when our exams are going to be, um, you know, our exam review days, uh, etc. Uh, a couple things to point out. So we are canceling class on Monday, January 29th and uh, Wednesday, January 31st. I'm not going to be in town, so we, we're going to cancel class. A um, couple other things. So, I mean, obviously we're canceling class next Monday for Martin Luther King Day. Um, the way I have the schedule set up, I have what's called a makeup day uh, right before spring break. So if we have weather days and whatnot and we have to meet uh, uh, that day, we will. But if we're good on weather and we haven't had any cancellations, we just won't meet the day before spring break. I figure that's, everybody's okay with that. I mean, we can if you're that excited about reinforced concrete design. That was a joke, not a very, not a very funny one. Um, let's see. We, we used to have a delay, or we used to have a cancellation right after spring break as well because of the Virginia's conference, but the Virginia's conference is during spring break this year, so, so we're going to be here. Um, second exam will be in April. Um, I also have another makeup day set uh, during dead week, so if everything goes well, we won't meet on April 25th uh, as well. Um, one other thing I'll mention, I'm actually also not going to be here on Friday, April 13th, but this is a lecture that we can very easily do online, so we won't be here, but I'll just post a video and we'll do that. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. All right. Any questions on the schedule? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? So that, that's on Blackboard as well, so you all can load that. Um, our final is the Monday of finals week, so we get done early. So I figure everybody's okay with that. Yeah, it's, it's the last day in April, essentially. So, yeah, I wish we could have like another week during break, so, but alas. All right, uh, I think everything that's in the syllabus is here in these first slides. So here, let me just do this. Okay, so my grade distribution, it, it hasn't changed from structural analysis. Um, the textbook is uh, uh, by, by McCormick and Brown. This is a really good book, I, I, I will say that. Um, you know, regard, whether you buy it or not um, uh, is up to you, but I do think it is, it is one of the better reinforced concrete textbooks out there. Um, a lot of times with, with, uh, with reinforced concrete and with structural steel, there are textbooks that just get right down to it and say, you know, here's reinforced concrete. And then there are a lot of books that spend a lot of time in derivation land and theory and all that. And all that stuff's good. I, I do think this, this book provides a pretty healthy balance. Um, one thing that is a little unfortunate is uh, uh, the addition. Um, like in structural analysis, you know, you could get theoretically any addition of a textbook and it would be fine because a lot of the, the things in structural analysis, they haven't really changed since the apple fell on Newton's head. But with design courses and particularly structural design courses, the addition does kind of matter because the code changes from textbook to textbook. Now, I actually don't make you purchase the code in this book because we actually, I mean, if you look at the ACI 318 spec, I mean, it's hundreds of pages long, and we actually don't directly use that much of it. And what we do use, we can teach, so it's not really that necessary to purchase. But the textbook does follow along with that. I mean, I'll leave it to you all to, whether or not you want to purchase it or not. The only other point I'll make is that the homework problems are coming right out of this, so it's your responsibility to, uh, uh, to get that, or at least most of the homework problems are coming out of it. Um, what else? Uh, attendance sheet. Um, really, just try and be here on time. Uh, I mean, you know, same deal as it has been. Just, just really try and be here on time. Uh, I'm recording everything, so, uh, so you know, if bless you, if you miss a day, I can, you know, you, you can review the the video. Um, 
I will do my best, I, I'm trying to get better with this, to try and repeat the questions that are being asked. I think I already messed up with that earlier because I had a question and I didn't repeat it. But if you ask a question, I'll do my best to repeat it. Um, that was a comment that, you know, if you miss a day and somebody asks a question, I just answer it. The people on the, watching the video don't know what was being asked. So I'll do my best to try and uh, do that. Blackboard, I'm putting everything on Blackboard, so make sure that you, uh, you check that quite regularly. <coughs> and same deal as before, uh, exams, there's three exams, and in this class, they really, uh, this, this, this tends to be more true in this class than in others, that they're not comprehensive. Like in structural analysis, like let's say homework two to do, let's say trust deflections. We had to know how to solve a trust, which is what was covered on exam one. So, you know, in structural analysis, the exams weren't intended to be comprehensive, but indirectly they kind of became that. Well, that's not really the case in here. The exams really truly are uh, not comprehensive. You know, you know, exam one and exam two are on completely different topics. So, I think you'll find uh, I think you'll find that to be. Uh, a uh, quite welcomed uh, improvement with the material, but can't really get around that in structural analysis. It sort of is what it is. Um, I'm going to let you all use the formula sheet the same as before. One other thing I will mention um, uh, with, with this class, and I'll go ahead and say it right off the bat, um, this class will require the use of some design aids. You'll have that tabulated data on the exam. I, I'm not going to make you start reproducing the beam design aid, you see that thing, it, it's huge, so I'm not going to make you do that. So any of that repetitive tabulated data you will have, so you don't need to worry about that. Just formulas, methods, just no worked out examples, same, same as before. Any questions? All right. I, oh God, I'm just setting things already, popping up. Day, it wouldn't be day one, oh God, it wouldn't be day one without these pop-up things popping up. Okay. All right. Um, let's actually sort of get right into it. Um, don't worry, we're not going to do any, you know, uh, uh, crazy in-depth examples or anything today. I just want to sort of get back into the swing of things and start talking about design. How do we actually design? I mean, just so everybody's aware, you know, what are we doing in this class? The, the purpose of this class is, you know, you know, reinforce concrete design, what we're essentially trying to do is take what we did in structural analysis and carry it through to its next logical step. So let's just keep, a, uh, let's just keep it simple. Let's say I have a simply supported beam and I've got, let's say, a uniformly distributed load on it. It's like a 30-foot long beam and there's two kips per foot on it. Okay? Everybody in this room should be able to take that beam and solve for support reactions, draw the shear diagram, draw the moment diagram, Draw, uh, calculate so the deflections, all that, okay? That, that should be pretty basic, okay? Might have been a while, but you've done it. I know you've done it because I taught you how to do it, all right? But that's where it stopped in structural analysis. You know, you have a bending moment diagram and you have a maximum moment of 280 foot kips, well, whoop de doo you know? Wh who cares, you know? Why, why, what is so important about that 280 foot kips on that moment diagram? Well, that's where reinforced concrete design comes into play. The purpose of what we're doing in this class is to carry it through to its next step. The idea in here is to try and determine, well, how wide does that beam need to be? How deep does that beam need to be? How many number seven rebar or number seven bars need to go into that beam in order to adequately resist those loads? So what we're trying to do in here is design the beams and the columns and the slabs and et cetera in order to safely resist those loads. So, that, that's one thing I think students, they, they tend to get a little bit more of an appreciation with what we do in here because in structural analysis, you know, the answer was M max is 280 foot kips and you go, great. In here, the answer is going to be use a beam that's 12 inches wide, you know, 20 inches deep and have, you know, four number six bars. So I think there's a little bit more of a reality to what we're doing in here. You're actually going to see a tangible end result. To, uh, to, to what we're talking about. It'll take a little while to get there, um, but I think you'll, uh, you'll appreciate that. But, so, so that's sort of the general point of, of what we're doing in reinforced concrete design. And what I want to do today is kind of give you a broad overview of how exactly do we go about that. And, and what I'm sort of getting a round, uh, roundabout way of discussing is our design philosophies. So our primary goal as structural engineers 
is to size members. So in here we're talking about beams and slabs and columns. We want to size those components so that they can adequately and safely sustain the loads they're being subjected to. So, for instance, if we were on the third floor of this building, and I'm sitting here walking on this floor, and I got 30 some odd students in here, and I got tables and chairs and carpet and drop ceilings and all this stuff. This is all being supported ultimately by a reinforced concrete slab. Well, how thick does that slab need to be? How much reinforcement needs to go into that slab in order to safely resist those loads? That's why we're here. That's what we're doing uh, in this course. Now, that's, that's our main goal. How, how do we go about that? I mean, how do we safely assume, uh, how do we safely design uh, a structure? How do we safely design a, a beam, a column, et cetera? Well, in engineering practice today, there's really sort of two ways of going about it, okay? One of them, you, you might have already had some experience with in some of your other courses uh, called allowable stress design or allowable strength design. And that you might not have heard that term or that phrase, but you've probably uh, been exposed to this in some form or another because it's basically using safety factors, okay? What I'm going to show you all today is a more refined approach uh, called LRFD. This is more of a probabilistic uh, approach, but we'll, let, let's keep it simple first, okay? So let's talk about allowable stress design. Okay, how many in this room have heard of a factor of safety before? Everybody, okay, good. So if you've heard of a factor of safety before, then you have used uh, allowable stress design or allowable strength design in some fashion or another. Okay, so uh, let's say I'm feeling pretty destructive and, and I want to look at the capacity of one of these, you know, very nice tables in this room. So I grab this table, I take it into uh, you know, a, a research facility into a testing lab. I put it under a hydraulic actuator and I start applying load, applying load, applying load until the thing snaps in half, okay? Now let's say I do that and this table fails at a load of, let's say, 800 pounds. So I start applying load, applying load, applying load, and then at 800 pounds, the table literally breaks in half, right? Okay, now, that would be its nominal capacity. What it's, that, that's what we term nominal capacity, how much it's actually going to take to fail this element, okay? Now, 800 pounds. If I'm selling this table, let's say, to Marshall University, am I going to tell Marshall it's, it's allowable capacity is 800 pounds? No, what I'm probably going to do is apply a little bit of a safety factor to that. So, let's say the safety factor is 2, okay? Well, if its nominal capacity or its actual capacity is 800 pounds, its allowable capacity might be 400 pounds if I use a factor of safety of two. Does that make sense? So, so a factor of safety is the difference between uh, an element's nominal capacity and what it's allowed to, to withstand. So far, so good? That, that's not that complicated, right? Sound good? N now, here, here's the problem with that. Okay, that, that's great for, for simple design, uh, uh, but let's say I'm feeling real destructive, okay, and I want to break every table in this room, you know, Hulk smash, okay. Um, but what we say, 800 pounds, do you think this table is going to fail at exactly 800 pounds? What about this one? What about this one? There's, they, they might be close, but there's going to be some scatter, right? This one might fail at, you know, 790. This one might fail at 820. I mean, heck, everybody in here that had uh, civil engineering materials with me last semester knows that, you know, we can all have the same concrete mix and the same uh, uh, mixture components, the same ingredients. We can all do the same experiment. We can cast a whole bunch of cylinders, and the results go all over the place, right? That's just, that's just life, okay? The facts are, when it comes to manufacture of, of any product, whether it's a, you know, a, a, an automobile engine or a reinforced concrete beam or, or, or whatever, the, the, the problem is, hold on, the, the problem is, is that there's always uncertainty associated with the engineering process, okay? Now, what I'm talking about now with the table and the cylinders that we cast last semester are on the side of resistances, how strong a given element is. So there's always going to be uncertainties associated with material quality. I mean, the top of this table is made of wood, okay? Wood is, a, is an organic and naturally variable material. Its properties here are going to be a little different than the properties in this table and the properties in this table, et cetera. 
There's also going to be issues associated with fabrication tolerances. I mean, I would imagine, just based on the nature of these tables, that probably some machine or some automated process was involved in the fabrication of these uh, tables, but even machines are only so accurate. There's always uh, fabrication tolerance associated with them. Also, if, if I had to guess, and if I was looking at these uh, tables, these tables were probably partially fabricated by a machine, but then they were probably put together by a human being. It's almost, it's all, to me, I'm almost thinking of like, you know how you go to Walmart and you buy that collapsible entertainment center that's made out of the particle board? You know, there's probably some machine that actually drilled the holes in those specific places, but then you're the one that has to break out the instruction booklet and say, okay, part A goes into part F with this many dowels. And nobody's remember, you've done this before, right? Okay, all right, all right. The, the, yeah, Walmart furniture. But the point I'm making, though, is that there, in terms of resistances, there is an uncertainty also associated with the human element. And that's definitely going to be the case in civil engineering. Because if we're talking about the, the Third Avenue parking garage or a highway bridge or, or what have you, it's going to be put together by people. Okay? And any time you throw people into the mix, there's always some element of uncertainty. Okay? Now there's also uncertainty on the load side of things because not only are our structures subjected to their own self weight and their occupancy load like us, but they're also subjected to environmental effects like wind and snow and if we were out in California, we'd be talking about earthquakes uh, and what have you. So there's uncertainties associated with, uh, with structural engineering not only on the load side but on the resistance side. So, so how, do we, uh, uh, how do we go about that? How do, how do we handle uncertainty. Well, let's go back to my table example. You would agree that if I broke this table versus breaking all the tables in this room that there'd be some scatter, right? But if I broke 30 some odd tables, that would give me some data. That'd give me something to work with, right? I mean, if I broke enough tables, I'd have at least somewhat of a picture or some, somewhat clear of a picture as to how tables behave, right? So let's say I broke a bunch of tables and I measured a bunch of forces and a bunch of loads. That's where load and resistance factor design comes into play. So the term LRFD stands for load and resistance factor design. And the idea is that it takes into account uncertainties through the use of probability and a, and a, a science called reliability. And we'll talk about that here in a sec. So how many folks have had probability and statistics yet? Even if you haven't, how many of you have heard of the bell curve? Okay, so most of you heard, uh, have heard of this. I, I'm, sure it, it, I'm sure you probably even covered it or talked about it even in high school. So going back to my table example, I can break a bunch of uh, or, or bust a bunch of tables in this room and I can get some data. And that data would have, let's say, an average and a standard deviation, et cetera, right? Same thing would be true of the loads. I mean, I could measure you know, wind, let's say wind on a bunch of uh, representative buildings and I could get an idea of average wind forces, the standard deviation of wind forces, et cetera. And if I have averages of standard deviations, I could come up with distributions like a bell curve. So this would be kind of an idea of, this is just simple, this is just looking at loads and resistances all lumped together. We end up uh, splitting them up when we, when we actually do our design, but this is just keeping it simple. So I have here a bell curve representing the uh, you know, average and standard deviations of loads and average and standard deviations of resistances. Now, a couple things. Notice how the resistance curve is to the right of the load curve. Anybody see that? What? That better be the case because on average what that means is that the resistances are larger than the loads. In other words, structures are stronger than the loads they're being subjected to. I would hope that's the case because on average that means the structures aren't going to fall down and people aren't going to die, right? That, that's one thing to notice uh, about this plot. Another thing to notice is n notice how the resistance curve is skinnier and a bit taller. Anybody see that? Does anybody know what that, like, if, if, if the bell curve gets skinnier, what does that mean? Smaller standard deviation. In other words, we should have more control over the scatter of resistances than we do loads. We can't control the loads, but we should be able to have some control over the resistances or the ones designing the structures, right? 
we should be able to have some control of that. So I just want to make sure everybody kind of understands what I'm talking about here, right? Okay, if I have a resistance curve and I have a load curve, well, I can take the difference of the two. So resistance minus loads, and I can develop a new function, okay? Now, this function is kind of important because if you think about it, any time that function is positive, any time that function is greater than zero, it means that the resistances are bigger than the loads, right? And if the resistance is bigger than the loads, that's good. That means the bridge isn't falling down and, 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 and grandma isn't, isn't dying if she crosses the bridge, okay? But any time that function is negative, that means that the structure is unsafe. Make sense? Now, if you remember, the bell curve goes on forever, right? So if you think about it, there, there's no way to design a structure that's perfectly safe. It's impossible. If you look at it in these terms, then there is no way to achieve a probability of failure of zero. It's impossible. But what you can do is you can design a structure so that you know what the probability of failure is. And as long as you're uh, designing a structure that has an acceptable level of risk, then you now know what the structure's level of safety is. And that's basically the long and short of, of what we do in, in LRFD. And LRFD is the philosophy we're going to use uh, throughout the semester. Now, the way that works is this. What we try and do is we look at our bell curve, and we take this area under the curve here on the left. It's called the probability of failure. Because think, this, the area under this part of the curve is the area where the, the structure is unsafe. So that total component there would be the risk, the probability of failure. And as long as we can control that probability of failure, as long as we can control that, we can design structures with uniform levels of safety. And by and large, that's how we do it. Now don't worry, I'm not going to, we're not going to start doing probability and statistics in the class. This is just more sort of the, 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 the theory and the background behind where the factors come from that, that we're going to use throughout the semester. So to give you kind of an example, let me see what time it is. Okay. To give you kind of an example, um, two very common loads that we'll use throughout the semester are dead loads and live loads. Now dead loads are, are basically in a nutshell, dead loads are loads that don't move. A very common example is self-weight. You know, if I've got a beam that weighs 200 pounds per foot, that 200 pounds per foot would be its dead load, would be its self-weight, right? Live load relates to occupancy, what the structure is being used for. So what do you think the live load for this classroom would be? Us, the room, the, 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 the students, the tables, the carpet, what the structure is being used for, okay? Now, let, let's talk about this from a probability and statistics standpoint. It's 1030 right now, right? And there's a classroom with 34 people in it, right? What's going to happen at 11 o'clock? We're going to leave, and another classroom is going to come in, a different group of students with different loads uh, and demands and et cetera. The point is, would you agree that there's probably a little more uncertainty associated with live loads than with dead loads? Make sense? So if we're talking about safety factors and trying to uh, develop a uniform level of safety, there's more uncertainty with the live loads than the dead loads, so we should probably treat them differently, right? When we use uh, load factors later on, the load fact, a very common load factor associated with, li or with dead loads is 1.2. So we're essentially calculating whatever our dead loads are, and we're bumping them up 20%. But the live loads, the factor is 1.6. We take the live loads and we bump them up 60%. The idea is because we're less certain about the live loads, so we need to bump them up a little higher so that we get a uniform level of safety. That idea makes sense. Don't worry about memorizing all the numbers and the, 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 data, and the data and whatnot. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But everybody kind of getting an idea of what's going on? Okay. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we try and do uh, in the background when we develop these factors, these 1.2s and 1.6s, et cetera, the idea is to try and control this number here called beta. Beta is what's called the reliability index. And it's basically how many standard deviations we are away from, from the axis. So if beta was three, our average would be three standard deviations uh, away. The idea is the larger beta is, um, the higher beta is, the, uh, uh, the safer our, our structure is. 
This will give you kind of an idea of what happened before and after we started using LRFD. We really didn't start massively using LRFD. I mean, it really didn't pop up until the 80s. And the first bridge specification uh, using LRFD came out in 94. So it's actually, you know, historically, it's not a very old idea. But, I mean, nowadays, LRFD is the standard. Now, these, uh, these bar graphs, this is, this is from the bridge spec, although it doesn't really matter. These bars are showing the reliability index for a series of representative bridges looking at different span lengths. So, so to give you kind of an idea, looking at, let's say, 30-foot bridges, before we started using LRFD, our reliability index was anywhere between like one and a half and like 3.7. There's a whole lot of uncertainty about how safe these bridges were. Now that we've started using LRFD, our degree of certainty has, has gotten a lot higher. We're now much more sure about how safe those bridges are. So I'm, this is sort of my marketing pitch that, that LRFD is the way to go. A lot of... Um, I'll just go ahead and say, a lot of engineers that have been practicing for 20, 30, 40 years can't stand LRFD because they think it's more complicated than it needs to be. And, and, and I can understand if you'd never seen LRFD before, you would think it's much more complicated because you would think, why can't I just add all the loads up and throw a factor of safety of two at it? Isn't that easier? Yeah, it's easier, but you're not producing a bridge that is as reliable. Okay, and that's, I mean, that's, that's why LRFD has become the mainstay. And it's not really an opinion. This is fact. This is based on, on the, the, the data that you see. So everybody kind of getting an idea of what's going on? Yes, sir. Uh, is, there, is there a reason that, are you talking about the, the what do you mean, that this gets? Uh, no. So, so the question is, um, is there a reason why that we're getting, we're more certain on the 120 but less certain on the 90 and the, and the 200? Not really. I mean, there's a lot of data that's going in, into this. I mean, there's a lot of different representative bridges, a lot of different um, uh, uh, facets, and there's, there's inspection data, there's material testing data. It, it's not that simple. It, it really is. I wish that there was a reason that that, 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 that one span length, oh, there's a reason why that, no, there's not. The, the general gist is that reliability goes up when you start using this, this different design philosophy. <clears throat> one other point I, I will mention, um, when, and this is, uh, for instance, specific to concrete design. When, when we first started using this philosophy, our, uh, our load factors were 1.4 for the dead load and 1.7 for the live load. Now that we've got more reliable data, we've been able to evaluate it over time, now we're using 1.2 and 1.6. It's very possible that over time we, those load factors might go down because we get more and more certain about our, uh, about our data. They'll never go like down to zero or down, down to one, I mean, but um, there's been evidence that the factors will go down. It's possible that happens in the future. I don't think it will. We've been using 1.2 and 1.6 for quite a long time now, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. If it does, there better be a real good reason for it. So that's a good question. A anybody else? Is it always 1.2 and 1.6? No, no. And, and that'll become clear here in a little bit. There are different load combinations for different <laughs> events. So, so to, to, to give you a simple answer, uh, it's not always 1.2 and 1.6 if you're considering different loads like, let's say, an earthquake. Okay. 1.2 and 1.6 considers, let's say, normal operation, normal everyday operation uh, of, the, uh, of the building. But here, here's another better example. Uh, and and I'll, I'm going to throw, actually, I'm going to throw bridges out at you. I, I think this is a, a more clear example. Strength one, which is what we use in bridge engineering, is the load combination that we use for normal, everyday vehicular use of the bridge. Okay? Now, let's take, I don't know, uh, let's take strength three. Okay? Strength three is kind of considering normal vehicular use, but it's also considering really, really heavy winds on the structure. Okay? like really heavy winds, like over 55 miles per hour winds. So we're talking about heavy storm events. Under like heavy storm events, 
it stands to reason that there's probably not going to be as much traffic on the road. Everybody, nobody's outside driving because there's a storm outside. You know what I mean, so the live load factor goes down a little bit, but the wind factor goes up. You see what I mean? So it's more about trying to capture different events on the structure. So, for instance, if you're looking at the wind uh, equation or earth, earthquakes, the live load factors go down because theoretically there wouldn't be as many people on the road. Does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that? So, so the answer is no. In, in buildings, we have a series of load combinations that we'll check. So like load combo one is just 1.4 times the dead. Load combo two is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. And the idea is that you just check all of them and choose your worst case scenario. But we'll get into the specifics of that later on. So. so along that, you said that even if your design philosophy changes, that it leads greater than just one. No, 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 no. No, that doesn't happen. Now, what can happen is your force effects can change. Like, And I don't want to get too far in, in, into, um, into this world, but the question was, do the design philosophies change if your span length gets higher? And the answer is no, but let me, let me give you a, a very basic example. If you take the design of, let's say, a 50-foot highway bridge versus the design of, let's say, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge is so heavy, just based on its own self-weight, that it gets the traffic for free. In other words, the, the vehicular traffic is nothing on that bridge compared to just its own self-weight. Like, that, br that bridge uh, is, is designed to support loads that are, you know, five, ten times the, the vehicular load. So the vehicular load is like, that's nothing. That's one of those bridges that if you can get it erected and get it upright, it's not going anywhere as long as it's properly maintained. But if we're talking about a 40, 50 foot creek crossing, yeah, the vehicular load is much more than the dead load. You see what I mean? So the design philosophies don't change, but the reality can a bit. So. Sound good? This is good stuff. Good questions for the first day. You all are excited about this stuff. I can tell. OK, all right. So to give you kind of a general idea of what's going on, when, when we use LRFD, um, we're going to be using different factors. So, so for the resistances, we're going to take our nominal resistance and adjust them by a safety factor that we're going to call phi. And we'll talk about all these details throughout the semester. Uh, for loads, we're going to take each of the individual loads and adjust them by their own factor. So the dead load's going to have a factor, the live load's going to have a factor, uh, and et cetera. And the idea is that if we add up all the, the, the loads and compare that to the resistances, as long as the resistance is bigger than the loads, then our structure is safe. And that, that's the general philosophy behind uh, what we're going to do uh, in reinforced concrete design. Um, when we design, we're going to be designing based on this given philosophy. You know, we'll size a beam such that its resistance is bigger than or equal to the loads. Now, we don't want to get you know, crazy bigger, like if we have a beam that has 40 foot kips of moment, we're not going to design a beam that can withstand 150,000 foot kips of moment. That's not design, that's just crazy. Um, but we're, we're going to, that's going to be our, 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 uh, our target goal. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right, <clears throat> let me see what time it is. 10 till. All right, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, loads because we're, we're going to do the loads part first, but I'm not going to get into any examples. Uh, we'll get into the example on, uh, on Wednesday. Um, the loads that we basically consider in a structure are threefold. We consider gravity loads, which are basically the, uh, um, uh, the self-weight of the structure. We consider occupancy loads. We consider environmental effects. Now, my main goal for you all to have a deep understanding of is uh, uh, effects that act up and down. So dead loads, live loads, and snow loads. We'll talk a little bit about wind and seismic, but really what I'm mostly interested uh, in your abilities to, to do in this class are dead, live, and snow, okay? Because they, they act up and down. When you all get to scene design uh, or steel design, we'll talk about uh, lateral effects uh, in there. But before we can get to, uh, uh, to talking about these loads, we kind of need to discuss 
a, a fundamental concept in structural engineering called tributary area. I, I debate, I always have this consistent debate in my head as to whether or not I show you this in structural analysis or show you this in concrete and steel. And I kind of always decide to show you this in concrete and steel because you tend to use it more directly in here than you do in there. Okay. Now, tributary area it is generally, if you want a general definition for it, tributary area of a member is how much that member is responsible for in the design of a, of a given uh, 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 structure. And a, a, a general definition, specific definition, is that it's bounded by lines halfway to the next uh, adjacent member. So if I've got, let's say, let's say this. Let's say I've got a, a given floor system. So I want everybody to make sure that they have an understanding of what we're looking at here. Okay? So the letters A, B, and C and the 1, 2, and 3 are, are grid references for a typical floor plan of a building. So these squares that you're seeing here are columns. So this is if I'm in the helicopter looking down at the building. Okay? So I see a column sticking up, a column sticking up, and a column sticking up. These sort of darker lines that you see right here, these darker lines, those are girders, and then the smaller lines are beams. So it's, it's kind of like hip bone connecting to the leg bone. The beams will connect to the girders, the girders connect to the columns, the columns go down to the ground. Make sense? So every, all load must go to the ground, to give you kind of an idea. Now, <coughs> our first task that we're going to learn how to do this semester is what's called a load takedown. And the idea of a load takedown is to try and take a given structure, take a given element, and ask, well, how much is that load responsible for? And like hip bones connected to the leg bones, keep tracking that load down until we take it down to the ground, hence a, a load takedown. So to give you kind of an idea, if I'm looking at, let's say, a floor system, a, a common way of expressing loads on structures is to express them as a pressure load. So classrooms might need to be designed, let's say, for 40 pounds per square foot. Libraries might need to be designed for 150 pounds per, per square foot. Why would libraries need to be designed for heavier loads than classrooms? The books, the book stacks, right? So imagine that, so here's this. Imagine, okay, imagine this classroom. Imagine this classroom has a pressure load applied to it that's 40 pounds per square foot. So every square foot has 40 pounds on it, okay? Now, so let's say, let's say we're in this classroom. Let's say this is our classroom right here. Here's our classroom, okay? And then, you know, here's, here's all of you. Here's the dork in the front. It's a joke. That was me. Okay, so you all get the idea, okay? So... Let's say I've got beams running along the classroom like this. So there's one, two, three, four beams. Let's say there's about a beam maybe right here, a beam right here, et cetera, right? Now, let's say I'm standing, let's say I'm looking at, let's say, this beam. I propose that this beam is going to be, it's got to hold up some amount of this floor, right? It's got to hold up some of the floor. I propose that it's responsible for all of the floor that's halfway over here, halfway over here to the next beam. Make sense? So if I'm looking at a given beam on the floor, I propose its tributary area is that. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? If I was looking at, let's say, a column, Let's say column B1, okay? I propose that B1 is responsible for all the floor that's halfway over to A, halfway over to C, and halfway over to 2. So that column might be responsible for that. Does that make sense? Because once you get past that, then B2 would take over, or A1 would take over. Make sense? What do you mean? Well, you're, 
Are you saying, okay, so the question was, is there an overlap between where B1 and B2 are both? Except, well, that's what the beam is for. We'll get to that here in a second. We'll get to that here in a second. That's a great question. So the question was, on the ones on the outside, would they be the same size as the ones on the middle? Well, if we're talking about just gravity loads, no. I would argue that if we're talking about just gravity loads, this one's going to be your, your biggest column right there. These ones are your smallest columns. Make sense? Now, that's if we're only talking about gravity loads. When you throw lateral loads into the mix where the columns are getting moved this way through either wind or earthquakes, then that changes a bit. Do you see what I mean? So in that instance, no, the, the, those exterior columns probably have to be bumped up a little bit. But if we're only talking about gravity loads, that's exactly right. The center column would be the biggest. Make sense? Now, let me, also, let me sort of get into this hip bone connected to the leg bone thing, and then we'll call it for the day. All right? Now, I took a picture here. This is a picture of the 3rd Avenue parking garage right down here uh, on Marshall's campus. Okay? Now, if you ever, I mean, I assume everybody in here has been in that garage before, right? Okay, all right. When you're in there next time, just take a look, uh, you know, uh, up at the ceiling. Take a look at it. Because I want, if, if you pay attention, you will kind of see this hip bone connected to the leg bone philosophy, okay? So if you're standing just on the floor or on, on the, the pavement, on the parking garage, what happens to your, the force that you're applying? What happens? Well, it goes to the floor, and then the first place it's going to go is along one of these ribs or along one of these floor beams, right? Make sense? Then what happens? Okay. Those floor beams connect into these exterior beams right here as girders, right? Then what happens to the girders? The girders frame into the columns. The columns go down to the ground. Make sense? So there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a transfer of load that you kind of have to pay attention to. See, watch this. Come on. And then we'll call it here. Okay. Let's say that you are this beam. Okay. Let's say you are this beam right here. Okay. We still got a couple minutes. We still got a couple minutes. Okay. Let's say you're this beam right here. So there's a pressure load that's being applied to the floor. Okay. Well, this beam is probably going to experience that kind of like the uniformly distributed load. Y'all remember this in structural analysis, right? Okay. So we have a simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load. So you all should remember from structural analysis that there's going to be some support reaction kind of like that, right? Make sense? The girders, now think about how this frames. Hip bone connected to the leg bone. The beams frame into the girders. Girders frame into the columns. Columns go down to the ground. The girder is really going to be more experiencing the load kind of like this, right? So if I look at a given girder, there's one, two, three, four girders framing in. So I've got one, two, three, four loads. What are these point loads? They're essentially the reactions here. So those support reactions become point loads on the girders. This girder is going to have a support reaction, and then that support reaction is going to go to the columns. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? I want you to keep that in the back of your head, because on Wednesday, what we're going to do is we're going to take a floor system, we're actually going to do a takedown, do it for real, and kind of see how this works. That's all I got, guys. I will see you all on Wednesday, and welcome to Concrete Design.